We are live. Just like this before. <clears throat> Here you go, um, Welcome, everybody. Uh, everyone can see my screen and hear me okay, yeah? Yep. Cheers, Dad. Um, might just need to mute some people, Taya. There's quite a few mics on at the moment. <laughs> Um, but yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, another London Excel meetup uh, virtual with Ken here today. Oh. Sorry, Alan, you may need to unmute yourself. Apologies. No worries. We can hear you now. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll allow uh, Ken to introduce himself like I, I usually do for these presenters. I'll just try and get through in five minutes of just upcoming events and for anybody who might be new here. Just the uh, general game and, and how we play it. Uh, so on that note, if I jump to my uh, upcoming event slide, which I don't think I missed anything out. I seem to be getting a habit of making at least one mistake on my slides every meetup at the moment. Um, but this is the current state of play, I believe. So we've only got one online event in the mix, which is happening next month with, uh, with Mark Proctor doing about Office scripts, and I'm sure a little bit of Power Automate, as it shows what they're, they're fully capable of. Uh, so that'll be a good one. And everything else is in person. Uh, you know, we had a change of presenter for the, the one on the 5th of September there. Uh, so Abiola David has, has kind of stepped in there, and they'll be talking about modern and dynamic formulas in Excel. Uh, for anybody who's new-ish to this group, our in-person events are strictly in person. They, they will not be recorded or anything. Uh, like this session is, if you did not know more on that in a minute. Um, so you have to be there, be there or not. Uh, but Abriola, David will be doing that venue to be confirmed because we have a, an office move in progress. So I'm kind of waiting to see what happens with that, whether we have that done in time or whether we need to be uh, reactive and get somewhere else. Uh, reactive, not reactor. Um, and in October, we've got a a double whammy once again both in person so you have to be there uh, one of them is in munich which has been set up for a while now so many of you have heard me talk many times about this we have numerous presentations there we're doing something a little bit different we're doing these kind of short and sharp um presentations so we've got the likes of anders sue christian robert myself martin tracy there's yeah, you'll find it all on the event group. There's there's a few people speaking. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see what happens there. It's so something a bit different, all in Munich, pretty cool. Uh, it's on a Monday. So for those traveling in, like myself and Christian and Anders and stuff, um, you know, most of us will be there for the weekend and some of us are, are running <laughs> in the marathon on a Sunday, which is all part of why it's there. And then we've got another one in London, once again in person to be confirmed venue. Uh, where we have Hank and uh, Michelle coming over from the Netherlands um, to do some Power Query and some DAX. Uh, so that'll be pretty cool. That's on the 18th. So, yeah, the couple of weeks after the uh, the Munich event. Uh, the only other thing, obviously, all these details on the meetup page. Go and find and enroll there. That's not meant to be there. Um, that'll be for the next online one. But things to know, usual stuff for regulars. Um, we always send uh, a post meetup event with links to upcoming events. Anything that Ken wants to share or we want to say will be in that follow up email. If you want to be involved in that, make sure you have RSVP'd to this event. Now, you don't need to RSVP to click a link and attend. So sometimes people don't, but if you want to be fully involved, make sure you do, or you will not get any messages or follow up material. And also, just a reminder that we are live on YouTube at the moment. So it's been done over two streams. Um, and that same link, which will probably be shared in the chat or has been and I've missed it, but it's also on the event page. Uh, the same link that's live is also the recording link. So it's, it's on the event page right now. Um, if you want to take a copy, but also be in the follow-up emails. So if you want to watch Ken do it all over again, exactly the same way, you can, uh, you can watch that. Um, and on that note, I will hand over to the man. If I stop my share and ask Ken to uh, jump into my seat, 
All right. Yeah, that's going to be a little difficult with the uh, distance that there is between us at the moment, but I'll, uh, I'll try and take over the, uh, the screen here at any way. Just give me one second. Uh, so we're going to share this one right now. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the meetup here. And I'm just going to quickly rearrange my stuff so I can see the chat window. So um, just for, for reference folks, uh, I have um, I have three monitors on my uh, on my desk right now, actually four, believe it or not. Oh geez, there's a laptop beside me. I've got too many screens on my desk. Um, but uh, I have the chat window open on the right-hand side here. So if you see me looking over this direction, um, that is because I am watching the chat to see if there's any questions that come in. If you see me looking in this direction, that's where I keep my notes. And if you see me looking in this direction, this is where my main content is. So just keep that in mind as we go through here. Um, so uh, basically um, what I wanna do first is I have got a, a little QR code up here. If you've already um, had a chance to, uh, to fill in the survey, uh, I appreciate that. And I apologize for it not letting you go to screen too. Sometimes Mentimeter does some weird things to me, um, but I'm just gonna hop in here really quickly and take a look at the results of what we've got here. So the first question was really just for my knowledge around what parts of, um, of Excel uh, you generally use here. And I can see that a lot of us are into formulas. So there's a bunch of Power Query folks, that's cool. Um, so it's great to see sort of just the mix here. And uh, what I'm seeing across the board here is we're all pretty familiar with Excel as a general product, which is great. It's was interesting to me when I go in and show a slide like this and things skew very much to the left um, versus to the right side of, uh, of the diagram. Uh, the second question um, that I asked on this one here was really around what your familiarity is with monkey tools. And I see we don't have as many responses on that. And um, the main, I'm guessing the main reason is because that didn't let you go there. So if you haven't had a chance to get in and vote for this one here, I would really like to see the votes on this one. This is probably the most important question for me. Um, and I thank you, Taya, for, uh, for dropping the survey link into the chat there. Um, this sort of little, helps me a little bit as to sort of gauge where people are in the grand scheme of things and, uh, and where they're going. So I'm going to let this one cook just a little bit while I go through and do the, uh, the quick intro to me. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Ken. Um, and yes, I am aware of all of the Barbie movie jokes. Thank you very much. Um, I am a fully certified accountant in Canada, um, based in British Columbia. I am also a fellow of the uh, CPA Canada organization, uh, which basically means that I have been recognized as uh, someone who's um, done a lot of work to, to advance the profession as well. Um, I do run xlguru.ca. I've got a website blog forum there. Um, I'm also one of the founding partners behind skillwave.training, which is a site where we actually teach people how to build uh, really incredible business intelligence models. If you're looking for good in business intelligence training, you should definitely check out our products there. We teach Power Query, we teach Power Pivot, we teach Power BI, we teach uh, just Excel in general. We teach all kinds of good stuff. So um, it's a great place to check out if you're looking to really advance your skills. I am a Microsoft MVP. I have been since 2006 across a variety of different platforms, including Excel Data Platform, which looks after Power BI, and I'm back in Microsoft 365, Office Apps and Services, I think they call it today, which is currently the category that looks after the Excel product. Uh, I am also a software developer and an author. Some of you may be familiar with this book, Amazon for Data Monkey. Um, please don't buy this today because you should be buying this one, which is the second edition of it. It's expanded, it's 50% bigger, a lot more stuff, you know, new, new material in there. Uh, but this is the book on Power Query, which will teach you how to really master um, what is actually going on in Excel and Power BI for getting your data in the right shape. But of more relevance today, I'm also a software developer. Um, one of the things that I write is this add-in called Monkey Tools, and we're going to take a little bit of a look today at how Monkey Tools can actually help you as an Excel user uh, or as a Power BI user in some respects um, build better models or build more efficiently. So I'm just going to slide this back in place now and take a look here at the 18 votes that we've had. Half the audience here has actually never heard of Monkey Tools. I am so happy you are here because I've got something really cool here that I'd like to share with you. For those of you that have used it a bit, I'll hopefully introduce you to some new features. For those of you who know it's bananas, I'll hopefully introduce you to some new features as well. I know that my good friend Christian is looking for an Easter egg here to ask about, um, but, uh, but there we go. So, um, and thank you, John, for the comment. I'm glad you love Master Your Data and uh, never heard of it, never used it. Fair enough, I can work with the same, same kind of things there. So let's talk a little bit about Monkey Tools. 
So the target audience for Monkey Tools is generally Excel users building models with Power Query and Power Pivot. However, if you're not into the Power Query and Power Pivot space, we still have features for you, okay? Um, it's also targeted at users who need to audit models that they receive from others. And this is one of the things that I run into all the time is that somebody will come and ask me questions, hey, can you help me fix my DAX? And I need to be able to run a quick summary over what's going on to sort of understand, are they even at a point where I can help them fix their DAX or do they actually have bigger issues? Um, hold on a second here. What happened to my slide deck that I am, huh, I thought that I had a different uh, piece in here. Okay, cool. You know what? Let me just, uh, let me just go one second here. I made a, a change to my deck yesterday and missed something here. So I want to get this out of the way here. Um, all right. So let's get the elephant out of the room on this one. Moggy tools is installed on a named user basis, okay? Um, each license can be installed on up to three computers. I am very aware that people who work actually have a laptop at work or a computer at work, a laptop or computer at home, and then probably another device as well. We got multiple places. So one of my things about the license is that I wanna be able to allow you to use it at work, but also at home because who doesn't work at home today and things like that, right? So every named license can go into three. Uh, the pricing model, because there is a pricing model. I am a big believer in community. And for this reason, I have a forever free version that has lots of features in it. And you'll notice a little icon here with the green check marks. Uh, you're going to see that on the majority of the slides that I show you with specific features in place. We also have a trial of the pro license. It goes two weeks and then immediately reverts back to the free license. So you'll never get charged if you don't want to. Uh, we also have a pro license subscription. You'll notice that that has a little certificate. It's yellow. And this again is gonna show up on our individual slides. So you'll know whether or not there are paid features that actually implement or uh, impact different things. Key thing about this, you can opt in or opt out of the, um, the uh, pay for model whenever you like. Um, my goal here is to uh, basically have that um, pay for feature when people need it, but you know, not when they don't. I'm, I'm about trying to get something into your hands that's actually useful. Full details of this can be found. Uh, Monkey Tools has its own website at monkeytools.ca because we are proudly Canadian. Um, and uh, you can find out more details there, download the installers and whatnot. And I'll give you links to that a little bit later on. Now, I'm going to try and keep this to about an hour-ish. Um, there are some folks here who know me. They know that recently I did a presentation for um, a specific group of folks. And uh, in that presentation, we spoke an hour and I showed almost no demos. It was just basically talking about the features that I had. Today, I'm going to be showing lots of demos. So we're not going to go through everything. We're going to go through some of key features that I think will be useful for you. And we're going to start with this one here. Just a little bit of an overview. When you download and install Monkey Tools, you get a new ribbon. This has two different classes of items on it. Number one, what we call convenience features. You can read convenience features as buttons I stole from Excel and put them on one ribbon so you don't have to flip back and forth, okay? There's nothing really different about most of these buttons um, in the grand scheme of things. They're just, just standard Excel features. We also have monkey tools specific features. And these ones are ones that I have all hand coded in order to make them do the things they need to do. Within our green boxes here, we actually break these down into two different categories. We have monkeys and we have sleuths. Sleuths are detectives. They investigate things about your workbook and your models to try and give you some answers to what's going on. And the monkeys take action and do stuff, okay? Now we don't have an infinite number of monkeys, but they can actually bash out some pretty cool code as you'll see. All right, uh, for those of you who are using Monkey Tools, there has been an update I published yesterday that actually adds some new things here, just so you know. Um, we've got some updates to the Smart Folder Query and Monkey. Uh, this now allows you to connect to uh, SharePoint or folder.files or SharePoint and folder.contents just by switching a parameter. Um, so this is really, really useful, can make things a little bit faster. We've also added some function documentation for FN get parameter and FN smart folder. If you have read uh, Master Your Data or M is for Data Monkey, you may be familiar with the FN get parameter function that pulls from a parameter table. I've now updated this with documentation to actually show on the function how it works. Okay, so uh, yes, indeed, Alan, uh, Monkey Tools does check for defaults every 14 days by default. You can customize that if you like. You can even check for manual updates anytime you want, which is handy because Ken publishes on a 
whenever he does stuff, kind of schedule. Sometimes that can be five times in one day, and sometimes it can be once in a month and a half. So it really depends on uh, on how much uh, Ken is focusing on development versus teaching and doing other things. The first feature I want to introduce you to is Control T. One of the things that drives me absolutely crazy in the Excel world is when you press Control T, you cannot name your table up front. So we added a from table or range monkey. And what this does, it can replaces Control T um, and your get data from table experience also uh, does Control L. Um, this allows you to define tables, named ranges or dynamic arrays um, and actually allows you to set their names when you're building them. We also allow you to create a connection only query during the creation of your named or table, which is actually kind of cool because sometimes that's all we need to do with it is do that. And you can name these things before creating a query. This is super important. If any of you have ever been in a scenario where you use get data, it assigns your default name of table one to your table. You create your query, you do stuff, you go back to Excel, rename your table and it breaks your query. That needs to stop. And this is the tool that allows you to do that. This is also fully functional in a free license. You just need to have monkey tools installed to get this ability. And we do not charge for this because I think this is something that should actually be in the native Excel product. Uh, of course, this is the only feature that we have that actually interrupts Excel's defaults. And for that reason, we need to give you the ability to turn it off. So we can uh, choose to use Excel's default behavior and we got some granular control that I'll show you on that. Um, we can also turn on connection only query by default and uh, we can also even provide custom prefaces for things. So let me go and uh, quickly flip over to uh, Excel here. And um, what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna actually go and grab a, a demo file here. Um, this one here is uh, from table range feature. And let me show you how this one actually works. So I've got a range, a bunch of ranges of different data here. So this is just data, data, data with no headers. This is actually a dynamic array that pulls from this particular area here and another dynamic array. Here. So what I wanna show you right now is if I go to control T, this is the monkey tools experience. It comes up and tells you right away, hey, look, I'm gonna be making a table and I'll show you this is just a little bit different. If I select a couple of cells within a range, it says, well, you probably want a named range. We'll let you actually define workbook or sheet level scopes here. This will hard code into a specific area. I don't generally set up ranges in the middle of my tabular data. So here we go. Uh, I can choose to replace the name. So I can call this something like sales. Uh, it tells me where the range is for my table. It knows my data has header. We check this box 100% of the time, not like Excel that keeps forgetting when it's all text that it has headers. Um, in addition, you can also create a connection on the query. So let's see what happens here. Boom, there we go. We've just got a nice little table. And if I go and show the queries, you'll notice that inside this workbook, there are no queries. If I now go over here and say control T, this one here, I'm gonna call this one, I don't know, I'm just gonna call this one costs. Create a connection only query. And you'll notice that it actually goes and creates the connection query by default. Indeed, Christian, this does need to be a Microsoft default feature, but the good news is that it's free in Monkey Tools, so it doesn't matter because you can just install this. At least you can install this as long as it's cool with your IT department, right? Um, we don't need admin rights to install. We install without admin rights, but you should still have your IT department on board, of course. Uh, you'll notice here, we can see the data is actually showing up quite nicely. It's bringing the information in, which is pretty cool. Um, on this guy here, I'm gonna do something slightly different. I'm gonna go right click and I'm gonna to choose to get data from table or range. And what you'll notice here is that we have selected the area. Um, you'll notice that we have checked that my data has headers here. That's the default. I'm gonna uncheck that because it does not. And I'm gonna call this one here, I don't know, let's call this one investments. I'm a, a finance focused guy. And when I say, okay, there's a little bit of a difference here between what happened in this one and the last one. This one creates the table and creates a connection only query and leaves you in Excel. This one creates the table and launches you into the Power Query editor. So we can actually see what's going on. We can make changes to our query, do the things that we need to do before we actually go and load it. Okay, so that's a little bit of a different because we use the get data, but you'll notice that we added or it adds the headers because the table didn't have headers. 
This also works, by the way, right click. If we go and get data here, you'll notice that this one here is actually a dynamic array. It's picked up the hash reference for that particular array set of values here. And if I go and say, okay, on this one, it will launch my Power Query in. I've just left this with the default name of ARY. But if I go and hit close and load right now, and I go and insert a new row in this table here and put in some values, I don't care what they are. Um, if I go back into the array, I may need to refresh the preview on this. Oh, no, there we go. Awesome errors, because we actually set these up as numeric values. But you can see that the dynamic array has actually pulled things in. So um, honestly, I cannot remember if you need to have the uh, Excel feature to be able to name a dynamic array. I don't think so. I think it works anyway. Um, but be aware that that's something that I released this feature. And then about a month later, Microsoft said, hey, we're now releasing this to all channels of Excel, not just the insider build. And I went, wait, it was only in the insider build. Um, so this feature should, I hope, work for dynamic arrays. But if it doesn't, it may take a little bit more, uh, a little bit longer to roll through your version of Excel. It will need um, it will need at least 2021 or higher, may need 365. If you find out either way, just you know, let me know. I'm, I'm definitely curious. But this is the, the from table arrange components. Let me show you a couple of things here too. We have an options monkey that controls all of the options for monkey tools. And we have a lot, okay? Um, but the global options that I want to look at here, you can choose to use the default from table arrange experience, the default insert table button, default control T, default control L. So you have very granular control over which items you customize. So if you need to keep control L just for standard behavior, for whatever reason, you can do that. If you want to include the query by default, the, the connection only query, you can do this. And you can also go and say, hey, you know what? I want to preface my dynamic array with DYN, for example. When I now go and get data from here, you'll notice that it actually prefaces it with DYN and my cursor is no longer selecting the entire thing. It's actually right here where we can actually start, start talking and put in exactly what we want. And then we can say, okay, and it'll launch me into Power Query with my query called DYN sales that points back to my dynamic array called DYN sales. Okay, so um, prefacing of these things is also, uh, can be a quite a useful component, right? So that's the first feature that I wanna show you. Effects, impacts everybody completely free in Monkey Tools, just gotta have it installed and away you go. <coughs> um, and it should work from Excel 2016 and higher with one caveat. I have found one user who is using um, a, an international localization of Excel where the control uh, T and control L keyboard shortcuts are not hooking. I'm not sure why that is, uh, but I'm finding on the English versions of Excel, it works in 2016 and it works in every version going higher um, that I have found. So just keep that in mind uh, if, you're, uh, if you're looking at this feature, okay? So, so that's the first part. All right. The next thing I want to introduce you to is something that we actually call the BiblioMonkey, uh, Biblio being a library, bibliotech. Um, so BiblioMonkey provides you the ability to store queries and uh, measures and formulas and lambdas and VBA and scripts. Um, and it allows you when you recall them to actually um, use variable replacement tagging to actually prompt you with some contextual help or contextual replacements for them. I'll show you what this actually means. Uh, the cool thing here is that this is all written into a, a little database. If you store this in a OneDrive sync folder, you can actually sync it across multiple machines, which is pretty cool. And then when you go to insert it, um, the variable tags will prompt you for contextual replacements, meaning if you say, hey, I want to tag this for replacement for a measure, it will be contextual to measures, replace it for something in queries, be contextual to queries, etc. Now, you'll notice up in the top of the screen here, we have two icons. One's free, one's a paid for feature here. And this actually has a little bit of uh, a behavior change here. Um, if you are on a free version, some of the items like queries and measures will copy the signature that you can then paste it into something else. If you're on a pro license, it'll automatically inject it. Okay, so these are the cool things that you actually have here. So let me show you how this one actually works. I'm gonna jump back over here and we're gonna go and take a look at some BiblioMonkey demos. All right, so uh, I got three that I'm going to show you here, and I'll show you the demos of them, and then I'll show you the signatures of these afterwards, okay? So this is a format of a budget spreadsheet that I used to build all the time back when I worked in, um, in the accounting office in the real world, and the concept behind it was this. First off, I have a uh, a date up the top here, and I want to influence this. I want a formula that actually gives me the month end. 
Now the formula is super, super easy to write. It's just EO month, this cell comma one. But you know, if I'm feeling really lazy, I can just go and say, give me the end of next month relative. And I can say, what's the base month? It's this one here. I'm gonna influence it by one and inject it and boom, it's done, okay? Now again, this is a really easy formula. I'm not generally gonna store this because I can probably write it faster than using the UI for this one here. But this one's a little bit more complex. So the concept here is that I want to take the unit sold and if this cell is blank, multiply it by the global increase. And if it's not blank, use this particular one here. Okay, so I know how to write it. It just makes me think every time I do it. So I've actually stored this in my BiblioMonkey database. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert from BiblioMonkey my volume forecast with override. And inside here, you'll notice it's picked up the range already for, for what I have selected. The global increase you'll notice is an absolute reference here, okay? So I'm gonna go and pick up the global reference and it actually create, corrects a, or creates a proper uh, reference. The percentage monthly override is this one here. It's relative, this one's relative as well. And I've actually set this up so that it is, is actually enforcing the correct tags based on what I chose. And when I hit insert, boom, there we go. And you can see that it's actually inserted the let formula and replaced all of these items with the tags that I've put in place here. So it makes it a lot easier for me. I don't have to remember how to write this nasty thing. I can actually just recall it from the database. Okay, so and there we go. It's all the way across. Everything looks good. Another handy one. Uh, oh, shoot. I, no, that's okay. Let me, let me just go in and do this. Uh, what I want to do is I want to actually just wipe out all of this information here. Uh, what you'll notice is I've got a whole bunch of divide by zero errors. That's not awesome, obviously. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually wrap every one of these in an if error statement and give back a zero if it's not. So I'm going to go insert from BiblioMonkey formula. I've got some error handlers, if error is zero. Now here's the important thing about this. In the previous example, it popped up something to say, map me all the variables that you've actually tagged. In this one, the only variable I tagged is what is the current cell contents? And it feeds it into the formula. This is what was there originally. It's now wrapped it in an if error statement. So again, I just stored that pattern in the BiblioMonkey. We can tag it with formula contents. This one here, I wouldn't usually do, but again, just in the, in the sort of, you know, reference of demos, for example, here, um, I've got a weight matrix here, and this just really shows you the fact that we can actually tag with an absolute reference. We can tag with a uh, wage rate here is a, an absolute column relative row. Uh, this one here is an out or a relative row and an sorry, relative column, absolute row. Um, so we have the mixture to be able to set these things up any way we want and actually have them fill in nicely, okay? So this actually works really, really cool for, for uh, replaying complex formulas in a lot of cases. Other ones, another formula that maybe you need in every workbook. Insert from BiblioMonkey, a Lambda function, which Alan is gonna be talking about at my work, uh, my um, uh, meetup tomorrow in Vancouver. Uh, you'll notice that I have a few Lambda stored, worksheet name, for example, um, file path, file name. So if I go and insert the Lambda for L worksheet name, I'm gonna call it that, I could rename it, but now with equals L underscore worksheet name uh, A1, I've now got a Lambda in here that has been added into my name manager. And this is something that I may need to do in every single workbook, okay? So it's a really, really handy piece. Now, what does it look like? What's the back end look like? So we have this BiblioMonkey database. And if I hop in and take a look at this, you'll notice that I've got a few different things saved here, okay? So um, here is the L worksheet name. So this is the Lambda pattern that's actually in place. Now there's no um, real prompting that goes on in this place at all. We just inject the entire thing. Okay, when we go and take a look at the end of next month relative, this is the first one that I showed, you'll notice that we have two references in here, choose the base month and this one here. How did I make these? Well, what I did is I actually put in the regular formula. So I copied, I wrote the formula first, maybe this said A1 and then it said comma one. So I highlighted the A1, right click and said, add new prompt. And it says, what kind of prompt do you want? Because this is the formula, these are our options. So I basically said, look, you know what? I want a, uh, I want a, rel or, uh, I want an a relative row, so fully relative. 
uh, in this particular case, that was this one here. And then when I actually go and put this in place, it says, what do you actually want to see in here? So I could say, hey, choose base month. I put that message in and that's what showed up on the prompting on the other side, okay? In addition to this, you also have the ability to reuse certain tags. So this is a dimensional model, or this is a, um, a date column here. And you'll notice that I've reused the same tag in this place in three different places, okay? So you can find those once you've defined them underneath these guys here, right? So this is pretty cool stuff. Notice that this one here is tagging to an MSR for a measure. This one is a qualified table column. This one here is a value. So you have different kinds based on the types of things you want. And you'll notice again, these are contextual. This is a measure and therefore these are the variables that actually work with this. Now here's the deal. This feature for the right click to insert these, that's a pro feature. The ability to inject this directly into the workbook is a pro feature. As a free user, you can still write these tags, but you have to do it manually. And you'll need to copy it and then paste it into your own measure signature. For pro users, we make this a little bit easier, okay? Um, is there a naming convention cheat sheet to better understand what uh, what these actually mean? Um, yes, yeah, sort of. Uh, if you uh, if you actually head over to uh, Monkey Tools, um, let me just go and do a quick search for, uh, for Biblio here. Um, so we, uh, one of the things at Monkey Tools, just for reference, is we actually have a full knowledge base of articles on all these things here. Uh, all of the tags are actually listed here. This is what they actually look like. Um, so if you ever want to write them as a free user and write them manually, that's your Bible. If you are a pro user and want to actually understand what they mean, I think you'll get the hang of it very, very quickly because honestly, you're going to use the UI to create them and you're just going to prompt with them. You're not going to go back and mess with them in code anyway. Um, but that is the uh, the different component. We even teach you as a manual user for or as a free user how to do the tagging. Like I'm not trying to hide anything from you here. I'm trying to make your life easier. I'm just trying to make your life even easier if you're willing to share a little bit of money with me because of the development effort that I put into this, okay? Um, let me show you another one. This is a power query. So here we go. What this query does, if I inject this, let me go back and here we go, inject. So I'm gonna inject this uh, Squint's 2009 sales summary. So this is reading from a, an Azure SQL database. And uh, this is one that I use for training inside my courses. And we have a location called the Squints. Um, and we have a, a year obviously for 2009. So what's happening right now is that we've actually loaded 15 rows of data from the database for 2009, the Squints location. Now, maybe, I use this particular thing all the time and I need to redo this in different workbooks. I'm getting some information for budgets here, for example. Here's how this works in earnest, okay? Let me copy this pattern, come over here to annual location, control A, control V and update. Okay, so I've got the exact same thing in my annual location, but here's what I want. I'm gonna take 2009, right click, add new prompt and I'm gonna add some text and I'm gonna choose enter a year. And there we go, it tags it in there with the text for enter a year and then the squints. Now here's the tricky part on this one. We need this location to be between quotes. So you gotta select it carefully, uh, but then we're gonna go with this one here and say, enter a location. I'm gonna choose update and I'm now gonna inject it. Remember this was the same signature before and notice annual location sales summary, that was the name of it. Where do you want it to go? Connection only or to the data model. What year would you like to actually work on this one here? So I'm gonna go 2013 and the location here, I'm gonna choose a different one. This is gonna be the tax evader location. And when I go and say inject now, what you'll see is it injects a new query called annual location sales summary. It pulled that from here, but you can override it. And it's now gonna go through and it's gonna do its work and then it'll come back and tell me, well, this one didn't actually load. So let's go and say uh, show the peak because the load is connection only, but notice it's 2013 tax evader. And if I wanted to actually go back and look at the M code behind that, you'd notice that those things have been changed. Okay, so this is really useful for queries that you might need to pull back multiple times. Again, if you're on a free license, we give you the ability to copy. You can then come over here and right click and paste in the query pane. If you're a pro user, we'll make it a heck of a lot easier. Okay, so we store queries, measures, formulas. VBA, I can't inject VBA, unfortunately, not yet. Office scripts, can't inject those either, um, but at least we can store them. So if you've got a bunch of them that you need to use across different client sites or things like that, if you're a consultant, there you go. We store Lambda functions, which are really useful as well. Uh, for all free users, 
Anything that shows up here, formula lambda, these are automatically injected. You do not need a pro license to do that. Okay, so for formulas, it works nice and easy on a free license. Uh, there you go, Christian. I'm glad that I show you something cool and new that you haven't used before. That always makes me happy, my friend. Um, so there we go. This is the BiblioMonkey. Um, it's a relatively recent release feature, uh, but I think it's impactful to all users of Excel to make life a little bit easier. Um, and again, you know, has a mixture of free and, uh, and you know, um, paid content to it. All right, for those of you who use Power Query, how many of you have set up a solution before and then you send it to someone else in your organization and they have a different file path map, then the solution breaks and you got to teach them how to edit M code and it's terrifying. Been there, done that. And this is something that, this is what this one here will hopefully fix, okay? So we use a, a little function here called smart file or smart folder. We have two different functions that are in here. Yeah, nightmare fuel, indeed. So I got a solution for you. This is the thing, right? So this these functions allow you to easily switch between local and SharePoint hosted file paths, as well as different local paths. So if I've got, let's say that, um, you know, my path or drive mapping is set to C users, uh, username, KPELS, backslash data, whatever else, and I send it to somebody else in my organization that has a different username, which is pretty common, uh, we need things to work. So that we can use a, a function to dynamically get the file path back from the workbook. But then the problem is if we get Office 365 involved, sometimes that actually switches out to a SharePoint path, which needs a different connector. So this, these functions originally were designed to allow for that smart switching but I've just recently also updated this to allow you to smart switch between the dot files and dot contents connectors. Now, why this is important is because dot files is what's available through the user interface, dot contents isn't. You can hack it with your M code, but what's nice about dot contents is it gives you only the contents of the folder, not the folder and all subfolders, which makes it faster when you're building bigger solutions because it doesn't necessarily have to comb through all of your subfolders to enumerate your files. Uh, my philosophy on this one, functions for free, monkeys for pros. Okay, so this is why we got green and yellow up in the top right hand corner. What does that mean? It means that on the menu, you will find the ability to insert the smart file and smart folder features. You wanna know how to hook them up? Go to the monkey tools site, take a look. We have a complete walkthrough of how to do all of the work manually. Okay, so I'm not trying to hide anything from here. The monkeys don't do anything that the free stuff can't do. It's just that the monkeys do it all for you. So basically what the monkeys will do is they'll inject a parameter table and the FN get parameter query if they don't already exist. They'll insert the smart file and smart folder queries for you. Um, they'll even update them to the latest version if you used them before. And they will avoid the formula firewall error that everybody hates because it's so hard to configure. So we've actually got this tested in order to make this work correctly. So let me show you how this one works as well. So I'm just gonna go hop back over here. And uh, actually, you know what? I'll tell you what we're gonna do. Let's not cheat. Let's go back and uh, I believe, um, I'm, you know, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna close Excel because I want you all to know that this is coming from a brand new blank Excel workbook, okay? Nothing up my sleeve. As a matter of fact, let's go show the queries pane here and you'll notice that there is nothing in here at all, okay? Empty workbook. So here's what I'm gonna do. Basically, the way you can look at the licensing on these components here is that everything above the line here is available for free. Here's the smart file and the smart folder function. Once you get into the inject queries area, there's a little bit of difference. This one is, uh, is partly free. Um, these guys here are all something that actually exists in pro license versions, okay? Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna inject this parameter table and function. If you are familiar with FN get parameter from MS for data monkey or from a master your data book, you'll know that it drives from a specific table and uses this FN get parameter function. And I'm just gonna go and show you what this looks like. Ta-da, as of now, um, it actually also has some documentation written right in here. This is brand new, okay? So I've actually got this stuff done. All right, now, the nice thing about this one, well, this one now says, hey, look, you need to save it. So here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit save as, I'm gonna go and drop this into my demos folder and we're gonna go find smart pass. I'll save it right over top of the old one. There we go, blow away my, my backup point, awesome. And now uh, let me just do a quick F9 and you can see that we've actually saved this. Notice that it is saved into a SharePoint area, okay? 
There we go. Now, let me make a couple of quick changes to this one here. Um, I am going to go back over to this one. I'm going to go with a file called build better uh, dash begin XLSX. There we go. And I'm going to replace this. And this is the important thing to realize about what's actually going on in this area. These are all just formulas, which means I have the ability to add more rows and control these as I want. Okay. This one uses the cell function to pull out the workbook file path where it's stored, even though it's from my local hard drive, because it's in a Windows sync folder or SharePoint sync folder, it's giving me the SharePoint path. And this one I can dynamically build from other pieces. Now, the problem that I've got here, what if I turn off my OneDrive syncing, this is gonna return a local file path when it opens up. And I can't use the same connector to grab an Excel workbook from a local versus a SharePoint path. So here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to query monkeys and I'm gonna choose the smart file monkey. Okay, so this is the smart Excel file. So which parameter holds the file path? Well, it's gonna be file path, so we'll say okay. And what do you wanna call this one? I'm gonna call this build better. So it creates a new query. You'll notice it's got a little yellow exclamation mark on it. This is normal because we're dealing with SharePoint. We need to go in and we need to tell it that, hey, we've got some privacy stuff we gotta resolve. I can't automate this for you, it's not possible. So we're gonna set our current workbook to be organizational because my uh, SharePoint site is already set up to be organizational privacy on a global level, okay? So there we go. It's actually now drilled into, I can drill into the file. Let's grab our categories table. There we go, looks good. I'm gonna go and hit close and load, and then I'm gonna go right click. I'm gonna change this and load this onto a table, and I'm gonna put it right over here in I7. Okay, so there we go. I'm now pulling the data out of the file that lives on SharePoint. I'm gonna put a fork in this one, pause it for right now, because I wanna show you the smart folder thing, and then we'll get into how the updates actually work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab some data from here, okay? Um, question, sometimes there's small difference between Power Query and Excel and Power Query tools and Power BI. Does it matter to monkey tools? In particular, will it be dynamic for Power BI for sharing Power BI desktop files or have I missed something in Power BI? Um, okay, this, this, this one solution here will not work in Power BI. And the reason being is because Power BI doesn't have a grid from which to store or to, uh, to recalculate a local file path. So unfortunately, the dynamic file path scenario doesn't work in Power BI, period, okay? Um, in Power BI, you want to pull from a web-based source generally, or you're going to have a data gateway installed, but you're not going to be able to have that smart switch between the two of them. I would say if you're using Power BI, target the SharePoint file, because then you don't have to worry about the path changing. Okay, so yeah, you bet. Uh, all right, let me show you the folder capacities here. Folders look a little different. This is a brand new update uh, that uh, that I just released in here. So if I go to Smart Folder Monkey, uh, Smart Folder Monkey says, what do you want to call your, uh, your files list here? So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this one as files list. I'm going to pull it from the folder path variable right here. And it says, do you want me to show you the files in subfolders? This is the default behavior that you would get if you said get data from file from folder. Okay, so this is the default behavior. We hit OK. It's gonna make us a files list query that goes into the root and shows me all of the files in not only this folder, but all of the subfolders. By the way, one thing that's different about smart folder versus the regular folder connector, in the regular folder connector, every one of these folder paths would be prefaced with this much of a, a SharePoint file path, HTTPS, blah, 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 blah. We remove that so that you can actually focus on the folder path. Uh, is it really that quick? Uh, there might be some caching going on on this one. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, right? It depends on how many folders you have. Like if I have 14,000 files in here, you better believe that it's going to take a long time to get the refresh because check this out. I mean, this is several subdirectories deep, okay? So this is fine. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to filter this down. And this is the way normal users do this stuff is we filter to say, I only want one folder, but remember, we still need to filter through all of the subfiles and folders in the entire SharePoint site that you've actually connected to the root of. That's the problem, right? So this is the horribly inefficient way to do things. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, let's go to .xlsx, okay? So yeah, you're right, Asus. Usually this takes a long time because if you connect to the root of the site, it needs to enumerate every file. As you go and say, I only want the ones in this folder, it has to check every file to say, does that file live in that folder? Yes, I'll keep it. Does it not? No, I'll move on for every single file you go. This is why that connector is so freaking slow. Okay, so here we go. But sometimes it's useful. Sometimes we need the ability to get to, to subfolders that way. But let me show you an alternate. 
Query monkeys, smart folder monkey. This one here, do not show the files in subfolders. Uh, do you want to replace files list with an updated version? Oh, no, I do not. Actually, sorry, this one here, I'm going to call something different. I'm glad I warned myself on this one. Uh, this is going to be folder contents, not file contents. All right, now, folder contents. Is this one this quick? Mm, often. Yeah, the other one, not always. This one, much more so. Why? Well, in this one here, we're actually connecting to the folder, but rather than enumerating all 14,000 files underneath it, it actually figures out, well, what files and folders exist in this folder? And then what happens behind the scenes is we actually iterate through the in specific folder path that we're looking for. One of the things that's really important to realize about this kind of stuff is that in the normal world of things, if you pass a Power Query function the full URL, it will fail. We don't care. We parse this properly to figure out what the components are that are needed and then drill into the subfolder. And what you can see here is that we have a few different subfolders, but I'm not showing the files within these. So if I'm only looking for this folder, I can now go and say, let's filter this to just my XLSX files. And boom, there we go. I'm now bound in the same place. Now I could time this. I have a feature in Monkey Tools to do this. Um, this is a very, very small query. But in my, uh, in my findings, what I found is that this one always, the other one might take on average two to three seconds to refresh, this one would take one. Okay, so like there's a big difference in these ones here. So let me hit close and load on this. And actually I'm gonna go and load both of these guys side by side because this is the next important part. So let me load this one down here. This is the files list version. And here we go, ASUS is gonna take some time to do its load. Uh, we're gonna go load two on this one here. We're gonna put this one existing worksheet and throw it right here. And um, here we go. And I don't know if you noticed, but that one is marginally faster, okay? But key thing, they give you the same content. Just two different ways of getting through here. The reason this is important though is because there are times when we need to get files from subfolders. So there's different ways to do that. And I'm not gonna walk you through a, a detailed demo of different places because that would take the rest of the meetup of different use cases for these. Here's what I wanna show you the important part about these guys, okay? You've got flexibility now to try and make your solutions faster. I know from file solutions can be very slow. Smartly mixing some of this stuff in can speed things up drastically, but here's the deal. I am now going to close Excel. I am also unfortunately going to get rid of this because I need to show you on my um, SharePoint folder here, I need my SmartPass to update. It looks like um, SmartPass has done its thing 21 seconds ago. So those changes are good. So what I'm now gonna do is I'm now gonna go and say pause syncing for two hours. Okay. I'm now gonna reopen the SmartPass file. Now, what you will notice is that the file path has changed. It is now a local file path. So the question is, does smart file work to refresh? Does the files list or the folder contents, do they refresh? The only way to know for sure, well, actually there's gonna be a change to the contents of these two, but not this one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open the queries pane. I'm gonna go and hit refresh all. And what you'll notice is that all three of them spin and they're gonna make their changes and boom, there we go. Now there's no changes to the content here because no changes were updated. But in both of these guys, you can see a new file got added tilde dollar smart pass is the temp file that you've created when you're working from a local computer. SharePoint doesn't do that. These have now both smartly switched in order to actually show the local connector version. So not only can I get to local versus HTTPS with this, I can also get to from files versus folders. So if you're looking at something and you've got a massive amount of folders inside your SharePoint site, it might be a better idea if you're trying to get down to a specific subfolder to say, hey, you know what? Instead of grabbing everything, why don't I do this? Let me grab all this stuff. Maybe I want to get just down into, um, where's the folder I'm actually looking for? Do, do, do. It'd be nice if this was in alphabetical order. Let me just sort this. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Production forecasts. Uh, these are XLSX files. Oh, I thought I had a folder for that one. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Um, so it would be better to connect to the root folder, drill into production forecasts. If I'm only interested in 24, drill into 2024. And then from here, if I want the contents of all the files that are in here, I can now go and expand 
to get just the files in this folder. This is going to be much faster than connecting to a SharePoint root or with folder.files and enumerate through the 1,400,000 files in there to get down to just these guys here. Okay, so kind of a cool thing. This is not exposed to the user interface, but you can get down through there via monkey tool smart folder function. Again, as far as the free side goes, we will let you inject the parameter table and the function that can come for free. You can create smart file and smart folder. The tricky part is you actually have to do the work to go and build a new query to do this and then to do your smart folder. Oh, and if you ever want to change this, by the way, all you got to do is change the file parameter. Change that to false, get your contents. There you go, nice and simple. So it's kind of it's a new uh, a new release, an upgrade to uh, to this particular thing here. Um, I also want to show you really quickly, uh, just for reference, even if you insert just smart folder um, at this point in time, uh, here's a cool thing around this. This is the documentation on how to use it. Okay, so uh, Eric, I know that you were in one of my uh, one of my um, self service BI sessions the other day, and I showed you a quick sneak peek of this. Uh, you can see that I actually did figure out my line break issue along the way. Um, but you know, <clears throat> the key question you should probably be asking is how did I actually create that? Um, but if that doesn't happen in the next thirty seconds, I'm moving on to my next uh, component here. So let me um, peek you documentation. Yeah, see. Christian, you need to ask how I created it. That's the key thing. Because if you don't, I'm just going to move on to the next section. So there we go. Let me see from current slides. So um, thank you, Mark. That's, see, that's the question that was actually needed. So here's the thing. Smart file today doesn't have documentation to it. Okay? So if I go and take a look at it, it doesn't. Okay, This is the way that it actually goes. Now. What I'm gonna show you right now is a beta feature. This has not been released yet, but this is what I'm doing. And the name is still subject to change as well. The doc function monkey uh, today um, is gonna to go through and it's actually only looking for functions that don't have documentation. So it's gonna come back with smart file right here. And what I can do with this is this, I can actually go in and say, this is my function. Uh, actually, let's do this. Let's go, this is bold function slash bold. Okay, uh, I'll put in uh, another thing here, say it is, uh, and I need feel that even though Gosper's not here, I need to put in my awesome. Uh, so there we go. Uh, it gives me the ability here. Oh, this is returning any, I don't want that. Let's return a text. So it's changed the function signature. And I can even go here now and add some examples for it. This is, uh, is um, an example. That's not how you spell example, but you'll get the idea here. Uh, the example code is going to be fn smart file. Um, let's just put in path in quotes, and the output is c colon backslash temp. Whatever doesn't matter. You can put anything you want in this. When I hit update, though, and I need to do a little bit of work on uh, on this thing here. This is potentially going to break something right now. This is why it's not actually out there. Uh, but the cool thing is that if I go and take a look at my smart file function now, uh, you can see that I've actually added documentation to it. Okay, so this is something that I'm building for people who actually use these things. Uh, I know that it's really hard to do this. Um, I managed to just figure out a lot of stuff, had to end up sharing some uh, emails back and forth with Microsoft to work through some nuances here. But, um, but this is one of those things that is out there and this will be a pro feature for reference when it comes out, uh, but just something new to, uh, to sort of help uh, things. Just learned last year to write PQ docs in advanced editor. Yep, now I'm gonna make you forget it. You got it, exactly. Eric. This is about making your life easier, man. I do the hard work so you don't have to. That's the whole goal with Monkey Tools here, okay? So speaking of that, this is gonna be my last demo. It's gonna be a big one though. I'm gonna show you some data modeling here. So for those of you who use Power Query and Power Pivot, please throw your mind or throw your eyes to the top corner here, green and yellow, okay? There are a lot of pro features involved in what's going on here. We're gonna start by building the model. This is gonna involve some query monkeys called table monkey and calendar monkey. We're gonna be using a measure monkey called the multi-measure monkey. We're gonna use a biblio monkey pattern as well. And then when we're done, we're gonna examine the model using a couple of really killer features that we've got from query sleuth and DAX sleuth, as well as generate some documentation via model sleuth. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that's gonna be going on in this next section here. So here we go. Let me hop over here and go into build better. And this is where a lot of monkey tools actually started. Okay, so here's the deal. What have I got? I got some data and I wanna build stuff like this. I'm not gonna build the chart or anything like that, but here's the deal. Right now, inside this, I have no queries and I have no data model. 
okay? It's empty. So here's what's gonna happen. I wanna pull all three of these tables into Power Query and then load them to the data model, but I use a specific method for dealing this. I, if uh, you've come to my courses, you'll know that the Pulse uh, methodology here follows the ETL pattern where we actually create one query that connects to the raw data, that's our extract. We have a staging query that does the transform, and then we have a load query that loads to the database, okay? So I wanna create these really quickly. Now I could do that, but that means that I'm gonna have to reference this query, create it as connection only, reference it again, do some work, reference it again, and set that one to load to the data model, but I can only choose one load destination for all the queries I create, which is a pain. So this job would take three to five minutes. I'm gonna use TableMonkey. TableMonkey pops open interface and says, hey, look, you've got three tables here. I'm showing you them in blue. You got categories, ew, table one, what the heck is that? All right, so here's the deal. This is my categories table. This is my sales table. This is table one. Here we go. Right click. Let's rename this one here. Oh, actually, before I do this, let me just show you. Yeah, table name can't be blank. Thanks. If I go to table design, it really is called table one. So let me go right click and rename this one. I'm going to call this budgets. So we'll rename your table for you right off the bat because tables should always have names. These are my staging layers. These are gonna load as connection only queries, which is why they're yellow. These are gonna to load to the data model. We're gonna hit create and boom, we're gonna watch our queries go firing through this little thing here. Uh, Ken, what course uh, do I reference the, uh, basically any course that you take with me where I teach you dimensional modeling, I will teach you that method. Um, my personal favorite to recommend is my self-service business intelligence bootcamp. Uh, it is, to be fair, the most expensive course that I do, but it is, complete. We go Power Query, we go uh, Dimensional Modeling, Power Pivot, DAX, Power BI. Um, there's more stuff coming as well. One of the things that's coming is how to use monkey tools to do these things because a lot of the tools that I built here are to make those people um, you know, more efficient along the way. And thank you, Christian. Thank you, Eric, for the for the uh, um, the encouragement on that. I really appreciate it. Anyway, um, during that happened, you guys missed it eight seconds it took to create all these tables. So there they are. They're in the data model now. Let's go prove that. So boom, here we go. We've got tables in the data model at this point in time. There we are. We've got our sales. We've got our budgets. It's a little bit bigger. There we go. Uh, now, I don't know for 100% which ones are going to be linked. So I'm going to let you do that work at this point in time. But uh, I am going to make a quick little change to these guys. Actually, this one and this one here and this one here as well, because this is the best practice. But I'm going to leave date available here. The next thing I need is I need to bridge the tables between sales and budgets. Uh, I need a calendar table. Now I'm way too lazy to write a calendar table every time. So we've got the calendar monkey because calendar monkey does that job for us. And what calendar monkey does is it will go scan the model, look at the tables and say, cool, what kind of calendar do you want? Do you want a 12 month, 445, 454, 13 month? I'm gonna go 12. What year end do you want? Well, I happen to use a September 30th year end. So we'll pick that. My data here, by the way, is from 2018, 2019. This is a 2023 date, but it doesn't matter. What do you want to call it? Where do you want to load it? Where would you like to calculate your start date from? I want a column that's going to represent the earliest date ever. That's going to be staging sales and the latest date ever, which is staging budgets. We're going to click next. It says, which columns do you want? You check the ones you want. Okay. And we learn from your behavior. All right. So there you go. Next. I'm going to create relationships between these create and here it goes it's created and this follows the patterns that i teach in my courses a start date and end date boom there's my calendar with 1096 rows i'm not going to read all this but it gives you some advice down the bottom because i happen to know what that advice is because i wrote it so here's how it goes we're going to go monkey tools this is what it's telling you to do is look we've created your calendar we recommend you hide the foreign keys so this one's going to get hidden and this one's going to get hidden and the other thing that we can't do for you Oh, awesome. Love the UI. There we go. I can't do this. I really wish I could sort by my fiscal month. There's no API to do this or else I would because this drives me crazy every single time I use it. I really want to fix it, but Microsoft has not given me an API to do it. There we bingo. So I can't hide columns in the data model. I can't control the sort orders of these. I really wish I could. But at this point in time, I've now got a full-blown data model that's ready to go. The thing is, before I start actually creating things, I need something else. I need measures. Now we can create a basic explicit measure. Many of you know, you can just drag a field onto a pivot table that creates an implicit measures. 
What many of you may not know is that implicit measures are evil and you shouldn't do that. But Microsoft never really gave you a way to go and create, you know, a basic sum measure. So this allows you to do that throughout, you, you know, not writing any code whatsoever. All I would need to do is go in and, you know, give this a name, sales dollars, pick my format, hit create measure. And it actually creates an explicit measure with the DAX signature format here. We also go through and we allow you to do smart aggregations on these things. So we're not going to let you do a, um, standard deviations on dates and things like that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll see, Christian. Um, but uh, the, the nice piece about this is if you, if you pull out a text-based column, for example, so if I go and pull category, we're not going to let you sum a category. Right, that you know, because it's text. So this gives you some, or performs standard deviation. So we give you some smarts around that. But that creates one measure at a time. I'm way too lazy for that. So we use our multi-explicit measures. Some different options about which tables to actually grab these from. I'm going to go and set this up, and you'll notice that it actually scans through and says, "Hey, I found a budgets table. I found a fact table. You have amount columns. They're whole numbers. We're pretty sure you want to aggregate those, but we see a conflict here because you got two of them that are called amount. So let me call this one budget dollars." I'm gonna set my format to uh, currency. Um, there, where's my currency? No symbol, no decimals. Uh, this one here is gonna be my sales dollars. Uh, once again, I'm gonna to go to currency and I'm gonna add another aggregation. We give you the names of all the columns. We also give you the name of the tables, but there's only one table operation you can do that's count rows. And that is gonna be my transactions count, which is gonna be a whole number. If I hit create, Boom, three measures done. There we go, awesome. And now what we can do is we can go and say, let's go and insert a pivot table from the data model. And I can go and put my transactions on there and my sales on there and my budgets on there. And I can break it down by, I don't know, let's say fiscal year. And my, let's go, hang on a second, a month short. There we go, boom, done. Notice that we start in January. We go to September because September 30th is my year end. And then we go from October to September because that's the way the calendar actually runs. Okay, so this is actually using my calendar table based on Calendar Monkey in order to get the correct fiscal periods all set up. Once I sort them, they actually work out nicely. So we've actually managed to pull in three tables with multiple levels of staging queries, build a calendar, link it together, build three measures very, very quickly. Okay, this job normally would take me probably about 15 to 20 minutes to do. I can get it done in three using these tools. Now, granted, I mean, I know the, the material I work with, but this is one of the things that we do when we're actually working in the real world is we rebuild things. We just have to. And we generally know our data fairly well after doing that for several years in an organization. Now, I want to show you one more impact on this whole thing here too, and that is around BiblioMonkey, right? Because I said there's going to be a BiblioMonkey aspect to this. If I go and take a look at BiblioMonkey, I actually have a time intelligence pattern here for month to date, X months prior. It's big. There's lots of tagging in that. Let's go and inject it. And it says, what do you actually want to call it? I'm going to call this month to date, one month prior. I'm going to store this on my sales table. The date column that I'm looking for here is calendar date. The number of months to subtract is one. And I'm going to base this off the sales measure. So this is completely contextual all the way through. And when I now go and say inject, it adds that to the data model. I can now go and say close the Biblio monkey. Here it is. I can add it to my pivot table. And what you'll see here is that on March 31st, month to date, one month prior is 143,000 because there's only 28 days in February. There's 28 days in February. Uh, there might be 29. I can't remember what 2018 was. There were 31 days in January. So my month to date, one month prior, based on the last date in February, is actually going to receive a smaller number than January because that month to date measure is only giving me up to the 28th or 29th of January. 2018th, not a leap year. Thanks, Mark. Um, in that case, the 28th of, Jan or of, of January because there were 28 days in February. Okay, so this is a measure pattern that I don't particularly want to have to try and hand code every time that I write it. It's long, it's ugly, but you know what? I have tons of these. This is my demo database in my real one. I got lots of them so that I can inj inject them directly from here as needed. They're all tagged for contextual replacement. Find the one you want, insert, map the things out, boom, done, finished, away we go, okay? So some really, really cool feature sets from this. Now, last couple of things I wanna show though around this. What do we have? I'd like to understand a little bit more about what's going on in the query dependency chain. So I'm gonna open up this thing called Query Sleuth. Query Sleuth 
Um, this is like being a kid in a candy store. Mark, that makes me happy. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoy it. You know what? I, I can tell you, I love working on this tool. Like this is one of my favorite things to do. If I were independently wealthy, I would probably just stop and just do this full time. Like I really enjoy it um, because there's all kinds of cool things that, that we can do with this. But here's the deal with this one. Let's take a look at budget. All right. So um, in budgets, you can see that we actually take your query and we've indented your query. So this is the raw M code behind this. This is obviously not a tool for somebody who's never used Power Query before, but if you understand a little bit about the M code, we indent it so it's a little bit reasonable. We do some color coding. You'll notice that staging budgets is highlighted in yellow. Why is that? Well, staging budgets happens to be one of the queries that we actually used, and we actually reference staging budgets to get to the budgets query. What other queries did we reference? Well, let's check this out. I'm gonna double click on this, and this is the full dependency tree of queries from raw data to staging to budgets, okay? Where this gets even more impressive, calendar. Raw data budgets goes to staging budgets, goes to the end date query, and we can actually step through this. Notice from start date to end date, here's the end date query. The end date pulls from staging budgets, we can go back all the way through to see what's actually going on inside these, okay? So with the right know-how on this, you can actually discover which queries are never used in your data model. You can trace precedents, you can trace them from dependents, so you can go the other direction. You know, in other words, what does raw data sales actually give me? Well, it looks like it flows all the way through to these particular queries here. Um, so, you know, it's it's a useful tool for auditing and making light code changes. If you just need to make a change to something because, hey, you know what? I don't want this to be called date. You can make that change and hit update right here. Okay. Um, now, what else do we have? Well, we also have a DAX loop. So DAX loop does the same thing. It's a measured dependency tracer. Okay, we've got some measures on the budget table. We got some measures on our uh, other table here. Notice that month to date, one month prior, pulls from sales. Okay, so there we go. We've got our DAX components that are in here. They're nicely indented. You can unindent it if you want. Another thing that's really cool about this, in some of the models that I use, I might have a measure which is called um, draft beer. And it's a calculate measure that does a filter adding for sales category equals quote, draft beer quote. I might want a different category that gives me my burger sales. So what I can do is I can highlight draft beer, change it to burgers, hit duplicate, it'll pop me up with a name and it will duplicate the measure, but with the new signature. So it's really quick to actually duplicate measures inside this thing as well. So, um, but probably one of the more important parts of this, you can use Query Sleuth and Dax Sleuth on a free license, but, you don't get the ability to have um, some of the color coding and things like that in a free license. The other thing you don't get in the free license is this. Over here, you'll notice that my pivot tables, I've got sheet three, pivot table one. That's because this measure is used on that particular pivot table. And if I go and look at sales, this one's used on pivot table one as well. If I were to go and insert a new pivot table right here, and I'm gonna go and throw sales on this one here, for example, and I don't know, we'll just go and put our categories on this, there we are. If I go back now and I go look at the DAX loop, notice that month to date measures is only used on pivot table one, but if I go to sales, it's actually used on both of them. And I can actually go and find the pivot tables where these are actually used. This gives me a little bit of tracing ability to figure out where measures are used. And we actually look at pivot tables, pivot charts, OLAP formulas. Uh, I can't select your name ranges for you, obviously, but um, but with the OLAP formulas, we can as well, which is kind of cool. So um, seems to have the same power for Excel, just like TE3 for Power BI. I, I didn't listen, um, Tabular Editor is a phenomenal program. There's a heck of a lot of stuff that uh, that is is amazing. Um, you know, I don't touch a lot of the stuff that they do, uh, but you know what? I mean, this works really, really well for Power Pivot models, right? You can actually connect this to Power BI on a pro license, but honestly, I think there's other tools that potentially are better for that. Um, but inside Power Pivot, I, you know, honestly, I mean, I, I think there's a, a lot of functionality here that is, is really, really useful. Speaking of Power BI, I'm going to show you a couple things here. These will run on Power BI in a pro license. Um, I'm going to run a model summary report. This is the one function in Monkey Tools that does not work completely on a pro trial license. We suppress every other line of this report if you're on a trial. If you're on a pro, you get the full report. I feel if you are doing full-on documentation on your models, you're doing it for a reason and you can contribute to the development of my product. 
But if you want to just run the, the trial, you can actually see how it looks. So here's what we do is that I've actually done a full audit report. I can tell you how much model memory is used here, how many queries are in it. Uh, these are things that I would actually look for. Are there any direct connections to external sources? That tells me that you're not using Power Query, which is really bad. Um, we don't want to do that. Direct link tables, gross. Um, we give you the relationship statuses, where the summary stats are. Uh, for those of you who know Power Pivot really well, you'll know that row counts and, and data types are very, very important. So we actually tell you how many unique values are in each column and what their data types are, because these drive impression or compression and the efficiency of your model. These are all of your measures. If you have calculated fields, shame on you, but they will be listed here with their DAX formulas as well. Uh, by the way, just for reference on this one, because I've got the source of this particular feature in the room, Christian, um, these uh, pieces here, um, when we actually go and we take a look at some of these components, if you get here, you'll notice this is actually a table. So you can change the table style on this thing here and you can add your filter buttons. And the reason this is a table is because uh, Christian um, actually asked me, hey, I wanna be able to use DAX Studio to actually uh, connect to this table and, and do some stuff with it. Um, so originally these were just ranges of data, but they've now been made tables because of that. So this is all of your measure stats here. This is all of your queries. And if you can actually uh, spend some time with this, you can read the query dependency chain in here. Again, this will actually work on a Power Pivot model as well, if you connect to Power Pivot. That's a pro license feature, but you see that we do connect to Power BI desktop files here. Uh, some of the things that also work, but don't work as well in Power BI, but work amazingly in Excel. This is a memory usage report. If we go and look at the calendar table, you can see that the day short column, I actually never use on anything, which means that I can recover 17.35 uh, kilobytes from my model. This is not a lot, okay, but it is some, right? So if you're trying to put out the most efficient model that you can, you can see that, hey, I've never used class, so I could go back and actually nuke that out of the data source. But this gives you the impact of what the memory is that's being used. Uh, we also go and we show uh, your unused items report. And um, this will actually come back and say, look, you never use calendar day short or categories class. These are natural columns in the data model. If you haven't used queries, we'll identify those here as well. So uh, yeah, it works very well to format DAX with DAX formatter. Um, so, and the reason being is Christian, as, as much as Christian is a friend and a fan of this, uh, isn't a fan of my, um, of my uh, DAX indention, uh, indenting patterns here, um, but I'll take that criticism and, uh, and we'll helpfully say that, yeah, I mean, DAX Studio or DAX formatter potentially does a better job on those things. Anyway, so, so yeah, the, the unused items report can actually go and pull things back. Uh, this does not work on Power BI models um, because we don't actually parse their visuals, uh, at least not today, um, but, uh, but this report will work and the memory usage won't give you the recoverable memory, but it will tell you how much use, uh, memory is in use in a Power BI uh, report as well. Um, DAX formatter could be integrated into monkey tools. Uh, potentially it could, Christian. Uh, the only challenge is, and this is actually, I'm glad you actually brought that up. Um, there are a few things that could be integrated into monkey tools. One of them is also a, um, we have our own indenter, uh, our, our code um, tokenizer and parser for M code, as well as for DAX. Um, I will fully admit that other people's are better. And I know that there are some gaps in mine. Um, I could integrate both the uh, Power Query and DAX versions from online. But the problem is that if I did that, then this, so this software product would not work in an offline scenario for all of the things that I want it to do. Everything in Monkey Tools, the only thing that requires an online connection is your license check to download updates. That's it. Um, everything will work if you are sitting on a plane working on your laptop in a disconnected environment. There is nothing that is going to fail because it needs a call to the internet. And that was actually a major, major design decision of mine is that I want my software to work where it is being used. And I don't want it to have external dependencies on, on anything else or, you know, run the risk of a website going down or not being accessible or, or things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things you have to try and make a decision in, in these cases and, and decide which direction you're going to go. So. Um, Maybe DAX formatter could be an option. Yeah, possibly. I'll uh, I'll think about that in the future for sure. Um, I'll put it on my my long list of features that uh, that I'm I'm still uh, still working through here. So um, that is about the overview of the stuff that I want to give you for or that I have time to give you for today. There is more just for reference along the way here. I mean, you know, we do have the ability um, in our stuff here uh, under my import export. Uh, we have the ability to import a Power BI model into Excel. That's one of the features that's available to pro users as well. Uh, there is obviously much more in the grand scheme of things for, for power users that use a lot of different things. Uh, but this gives you some of the, the cool killer features around Monkey Tools and shows how it really can help 
uh, boost your efficiency um, as you're working uh, working with Excel uh, and modeling. A uh, question from John, I missed it. If I use an Excel report using Monkey Tools and shared and sent that report to someone else, does that person have to have Monkey Tools? John, thank you so much for asking that question. Absolutely not. No, absolutely. One of my massive philosophies in, de in designing this stuff, and you know, this is funny, right? Because I know tools which once you use them they're hooked into your product forever and everybody that wants to use the workbook that's created with those tools has to have that product installed i vehemently disagree with that model and one of the uh, other core design principles that i had on this one here this is really stupid from a sales perspective but from my personal perspective this is the way that i think when you build something in monkey tools we're not actually doing anything that you can't do manually right i don't add any hidden hooks into your workbook i don't add anything so if you build something using the pro version and you ship it to somebody who doesn't have monkey tools installed at all you hit refresh it will work providing you've done your work correctly okay i mean if you put in something that doesn't work that's obviously on you but the uh, the end of the day is that no monkey tools does not add any secondary hooks into the product when you build it only the person that's developing actually needs the license okay so so that's basically it um like i say i could probably make myself richer if i change that model but honestly i don't want people to be afraid of it right i mean this is the thing i think this is a useful tool it's got all kinds of features and um and i, I want as many people to be using this as possible for nothing more than just control t i mean like come on that's that's awesome right so uh anyway how do you get your own monkey where do you find one? Well, you go to the Monkey Tools website. Um, Alan just shared the URL and here you go. This is it. Um, you can find the installer and the purchase options at monkeytools.ca. We have a full knowledge base, uh, well, at least I should say, it's a mostly full knowledge base. Documentation is always the hardest thing to keep up on. I will say that my um, smart folder monkey does need a documentation update, but I was uh, rushing to try and get some other things done before the meetup here. Um, so I didn't unfortunately get the chance to do that. I only published that update uh, just recently. So uh, there you go. Uh, if you do love monkey tools and you uh, want to help me distribute it and whatnot, we do have an affiliate program. I'm not going to um, sort of, you know, go crazy on that one, but uh, if you do, you're, there you go. Uh, I'll just show you really quickly from the monkey tool side of things. Uh, you can get the free license. You can just install the installer from here uh, right away. There's nothing else to do. I don't recommend you do that. Um, I actually do recommend that you try the pro trial. Uh, the main reason is that if you do this, I don't, and maybe you think this is a feature, but I don't get access to anything that actually lets me know that you have it. If you do have this one and I need to release anything that's a major information blast about it, I actually do get your email through this one, which means that I can actually contact you to let you know that something is, uh, you know, needs an update or whatnot. Uh, that's only ever happened once in the history of what I'm dealing with is that I did have to, to email people to say, look, there's a, an issue with the digital certificate expiration that we have. Um, so you do need to do a reinstall. Uh, but, you know, this is an area where it allows you to try those pro features and whatnot. If you want to buy it, you can do so. That's the, the ability there. Uh, you will also find for the majority of the features, we have a full knowledge base here um, that actually has a ton of different articles on it. So for example, if you wanted to go and look at, uh, oh, I don't know, let's see the uh, smart folder function, not the monkey. This will tell you how the smart folder function works. I do need to do some updates to it based on recent changes, but it'll give you all the ability on how to do this. And you'll notice right here, we even tell you how to put it in place, right? So if you're not on a pro license, we still have the documentation to tell you to use it because I want you using the tool. That's the, the key thing here, whether or not you, uh, you, you feel that uh, you need all of the pro features there. Um, the monkey, uh, this monkey writes the web pages. Um, that's uh, that's the, uh, the comment on that one that I'll make on this one here. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that is basically the, um, the thrust of, uh, of monkey tools in, uh, in a whirlwind one hour presentation. Um, I really encourage you to download it and give it a try. I mean, I think that you'll find that it's a useful thing. Um, I always like to know about bugs. You can always submit those. There's a, an option to do so on the uh, the help menu. We try and resolve those as much as uh, as much as we can. Um, we're also always adding features just for uh, for reference. My my uh, sort of development path on this is whenever I get inspired with a new feature, I will uh, go and spend hours building something to save you a few minutes of time. That's my philosophy along the way and to save myself time, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I've got a huge list of ideas of different things that I want to add into this as well. I get inspiration from some of the people on this call, like the grinning comment that just came in from Christian. Uh, Christian has actually submitted several um, thoughts on, along the way as well. So, um, thought about after your comment, I'm not a monkey. Well, who knows? Maybe I am. 
Um, anyhow, uh, so yeah, Eric, just for reference, that function documentation tool is not out in public yet. It is uh, very much in a beta stage here. There is a lot of work that I have to do to actually release that. That is a sneak peek of what is coming. Um, but, uh, you know, as actually, here's a fun story for you. So Eric actually asked a question last Wednesday in the self-service BI bootcamp. And I said, what do you think about this? And um, once we got off that call last Wednesday, that's when I started actually coding that thing. So the product progress that you see there is from within the last seven days. That's why it's not out yet. So it's a very, very early build. Uh, but I think for those who uh, who actually do need it, I think you'll find that it's going to be, uh, be very, very useful. So um, at this point in time, I'm going to stop. And I just want to open it up to questions. If anybody's got any questions that I haven't answered along the way, um, by all means, shoot. I am more than happy to uh, to answer any questions there are. Um, if anybody wants to uh, to share any comments on it, I'm happy to take those as well. Um, you know, it's it's a complete open floor uh, at this point um, along the way. So, um, yeah, fire away. And for reference, I'll take them by chat. I'll even take them by voice if you prefer that too. So, <laughs> but you need to unmute yourself, I think. Okay. You. Um, yeah, coding started after the call, just like every other idea I like. Uh, Christian knows that uh, all too well, absolutely. Um, yeah, there was a, a feature that, uh, Christian, was it you that suggested the export to uh, to CSV um, or, or was it Celia Alves? I can't remember. You guys were both very much involved in that, but uh, this is another one that we actually have is exporting the data model tables to CSV where we have a, an ability to go and actually create custom CSVs out of this. And that was, uh, I think Christian was definitely one of the primary drivers and that sort of came up in a in a WhatsApp chat and four hours later, I had a UI designed and was I was hammering at it. But um, yeah, so... <laughs> There you go. Awesome. Eric, I, I love to see that. Um, definitely. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that you will get this installed because I think that, uh, that you can definitely make some use of it. So uh, like many. Um, awesome. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in, Alan, Taya, so. It's all going to be quiet, isn't it? <laughs> well, this is either one of those they're all downloading it or their minds are blown or it's like yeah i can't use that and i hope it's not the last one right so <laughs> and if you're not blown, downloading it you should away. Be. yeah there you go blown away awesome oh, good listen i'm glad you're stunned but but honestly go try it like it's it's uh i think you'll find you like it i mean there's there's some cool things in there and uh there's a lot of functionality even if you do stay on a free license and i mean that was one of my goals with this um yeah, it's uh, it, it's huge. Uh, as a VBA guy, I know the effort that went into this. Um, you, dude, you don't. <laughs> Let me tell you, as a VBA guy myself, this became next level. I feel like I spent my entire career training to actually start writing this. This was there's some really interesting and technical challenges that went into this. Um, this is all built on Calm, which is uh, so it's a, it's a Calm add-in, um, but it has been a fun, entertaining, rewarding, and uh, mind-expanding journey, let me tell you. So um, many people are surprised I start my Power BI models in Excel, but they don't know I have monkey tools. Exactly. See, and that's, that's the thing, Christian. I start every one of my Power BI models in Excel because I can do it really quickly and get a prototype up and then just hop over to Power BI Desktop and say, import. I just wish I could write half of the stuff to Power BI Desktop, but the APIs there aren't there for it. So uh, we can't write queries in. That's the big issue. And a lot of the work that I do here that makes Monkey Tools amazing is around the query work, not necessarily the DAX side of things, right? You got to get the queries right first. So, um, so there we go. Thank you, Jason. I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Um, Alan, Taya, thank you for hosting me. I really appreciate it. It's, it's always great to be able to thank show people can. what I'm building here and um, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get to do this again. So. No worries, Ken. Thank you. Thank you for your for time. Sure. Thank you for- Absolutely. Tools. You bet. Thank you for yeah. a great presentation. We will be sharing the recording with everybody who has RSVP'd um, for the event. Let me actually share the link once again in the chat. On that note, I'm going to close down the YouTube stream at this point. So thank you for everyone on YouTube. That is being closed now. Awesome. And yes, cool. we should definitely do this again soon.